lead up, but look on the ASA. Oh my gosh, they're all going against the wind. It was basically a cube with inside of a sphere where the points of the cube uh, were touching outside of the sphere. So this isn't anything that just is limited to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. You've heard enough from me this week in terms of update podcasts and other things so I'm going to get straight into this one because I want to make the most of the time So I'm really excited to speak to this guest as I know many of you are very keen to hear from him as well. I have a journalist with the New York Post and host of The Basement Office, many of you will know him from, Stephen Greenstreet. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on. No, listen, it's uh, it's good because I've been watching you for a while, so it's nice to speak to you face to face. Uh, watching the basement office and really enjoyed the content on there, and you're, you're a real presence on social media. Um, you're you're not scared to speak your mind. You've ruffled a few feathers recently, but yeah. before I get to talking about the recent stuff, I want to take a little step back and find a little bit about your your past, your history, and kind of what's led you to where you are now. Um, so growing up, Stephen, did you have any interest in UFOs or you know any associated phenomenon like that? I did from an early age. Um, I remember I saw the movie E.T. in the movie theaters on its second release in the early 80s. And that left a big impression on me. And when I was a little kid, I used to uh, walk around the woods looking for an alien buddy. Like I wanted my own alien buddy when I was a, when I was a kid. Uh, so yeah, from an early age, you know. And then through my childhood and and into my teenage years, um, the X Files and sci fi these were all big things to me. But when I became you know an adult, when I you know grew up. I kind of just like let most of that stuff drift into my childhood as fantasy and fun stuff when I was a kid. And I didn't really like take it too seriously as an adult until the New York Times reveal about ATIP and the Pentagon in, in 2017. And then I was like, oh, wait, <laughs> maybe this is real. <laughs> I, I don't think that's unusual. I think that time period rekindled this in a lot of people and reignited a lot of people's passion for the subject and inquisitive nature did you ever have any like sightings growing up do you remember seeing any weird lights in the sky anything like that um well uh, a couple things one when i was a kid meaning around 10 11 12 years old i grew up within driving distance of aberdeen proving grounds which is owned by the u.s army and my brother and I, we grew up in the country. My brother and I used to go outside at night and in the direction of Aberdeen Proving Ground, we would see triangle shaped lights, um, small, not, not these big things, but you know, um, one, two, three lights and then a helicopter or something, almost like it was transporting it, whatever it was, uh, down to Aberdeen Proving Ground. And I remember we thought that was pretty cool. Now it, probably was a drone or f-117 yeah. or something like that but i remember us going woo <laughs> and then uh in 2003 when i was maybe 24 no 23 um i had a big sighting of a like a real thing a real ufo um i uh, it was at night and um i looked up and there was this big silent triangle it was just two sticks like this there was no body in the middle just mm -hmm. two black sticks with blue lights and it was just hovering right over top of me um not a sound not a and it was flying against the wind which was strange no jet sounds nothing and it just went over until it disappeared and that was a creepy experience was it moving pretty fast or was it going slowly like how how quickly did it go away no you know i i'm familiar with jets i've seen a b2 bomber fly i've seen an f-18 fly up close i've seen an f-16 fly up close i've seen obviously the commercial airliners it was flying way slower than any of those 
so you knew you were looking at something that was definitely out of the ordinary which that's pretty cool what, yeah how did that impact you at all like because what i find really interesting this is something ryan sprague talks about you know the human approach to the subject and whatnot mm-hmm. is p- these sightings happen but then afterwards like i've had a couple and i've talked about mine plenty of times now on the podcast but people ask me oh, and then what and well i went home and, and went to bed like <laughs> and then i got up the next day and i went to work like life life goes on it, it's for all it's incredible to see and amazing to describe it's that's it life goes on life doesn't stop like what happened once that sighting had you know occurred exactly what you just said i mean i i remember i immediately told a group of friends like right after i told a group of friends what i had seen and then yeah just life went on and it would just be a story i would tell about this experience that I had, but it didn't like define my life or change my life or, you know, put me on a quest or a mission or something like that. It was just, it was just this really creepy, weird experience that I had. That's, that's awesome to hear though. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Now, listen, your educational background, a few people asked me about actually what's led you to the point where you have a role with the the New York Post as a journalist. Yeah. So I, my, uh, the beginning of my career, I was a I was a full time documentary filmmaker, and I made three feature length documentary movies um, that, about a variety of topics, and you know all, those got distribution, DVD, you know sh- some of them showed in movie theaters, um, and then my next project was a reality show on MTV where I followed Kesha, the pop star, around the world for two years and filmed everything. And then we made that into a documentary reality series on MTV. And then I had a baby and I was like, oh, I I should probably get something that's more like secure. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Because documentary filmmaking does not pay that much. And so uh, New York Post hired me. That's how I ended up there. Nice. Uh, And obviously babies change lives. We have just had a a newborn and I've got a five-year-old, a three-year-old and a 12 week old almost now so it's a it's a handful but um i started the ufo podcast after two kids so i I can imagine how busy it is and you're looking for that kind of regular income and that uh, job security now what is your role at the new york post outside of ufo reporting i suppose we're hearing a little glimpse of potentially there with the the kesha background and celebrity side of things yeah so uh, i mean i'm the senior video producer at the new york post i produce and I'm hands-on producing, filming, editing, writing all of the New York Post's big documentaries. So anything that's that's like produced and shot and edited, documentary style, that's me. And so most of my job has nothing to do with UFOs. Like the majority of my job has nothing to do with UFOs. I mean, the last big documentary I did for the Post, besides Basement Office, was a... 74-minute documentary on this Leonardo DiCaprio movie that's been banned from Canada and the United States. It's like the only one of his movies that's not allowed to be screened. And so I did a whole documentary about like the backstory as to why. So yeah, I have a very, I have a lot of non-UFO assignments. Cool. That's good to know because, and you'll appreciate this, that so many people in the UFO community spend so much time on this. For some people, it's their whole lives, but for some of us, we've got other full-time jobs and different aspects of our jobs and, and family as well. So totally appreciate that. Now, 2017 rolls around and you you see the New York Times piece. What's your immediate reaction to, to what comes out? Um. <laughs> My immediate reaction, to be honest with you, was, you know, in in the media, not just the Post, but everywhere, it was it sent shockwaves through because it was the New York Times and it was the Washington Post and it was Politico. These were heavy hitting, well established journalistic media entities, and they were validating a topic that for so long was ridiculed or joked with, toyed with. And so I think everyone in the newsroom was like, wait, how do we cover this? And I, as someone who had, you know, low key spent my whole life kind of paying attention to UFOs, I was like gnawing at the bit to speak up and say, I know something. I know a little bit about this topic. Um, Ask me, ask me, you know, that kind of thing. And I, 
I, slowly but surely, people kept turning to me for questions or, oh, this new UFO thing came here, hand it to Steven, you know, have him work it a little bit. And that eventually became, let's just do a whole video series out of this. So that's where the basement office came from. Uh, and that was going to be my next question. So the yeah. basement office comes from the aspect of you're getting all this footage in and these people talking about it and there's a media buzz. How does it come to be the that episode one where it's yourself and Nick Pope talking about, <laughs> you know, the, the Nimitz Princeton? How does Nick get involved yeah, as well? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, so the the real story is is that they the post just asked me to pitch an idea for a UFO video series, and honestly, I think what they want like expected was like short, easily produced six minute episodes of like just me with a script in front of like a green screen reading something. This week. The Pentagon said, blah, 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 the end. Like, that was all they were, like, expecting. So, But I went, like, overboard. I was like, no, I want this whole set, and I want it to be in the basement, and, and I'll build it myself. And I built I built the whole the, – the basement office set was actually a storage room in real life. It was just a storage room. And I, like, cleaned it out and then, like, painted it and decorated it and made it. And um, – and then with Nick, we sent out we sent out a bunch of emails um, to a bunch of ufologists, well known ufologists, as a wide net. And I didn't really expect any of them to respond, <laughs> but Nick responded positively immediately and was all for it. And uh, Nick was only supposed to be in one episode, the first episode. But when he came out and shot, we were like, oh, he's awesome. Like, we need to put him in all the episodes. <laughs> so we just, that's how he became, you know, the co-host. And listen, we'll take a quick sidebar for a second because people will shoot me if I don't ask about this. Now, Nick Pope's background um, was well known, especially here in the UK. He is the go-to guy for UFOs. If there is a piece in a, a tabloid newspaper or, you know, the, the BBC, you tend to see Nick Pope as a talking head or quoted in the paper. He was the, the X-Files guy, which is usually what he's addressed as within the paper. However, his background has came into question over the last last year or two. Now, there's no doubting Nick is a, is a nice guy. I've met him. Uh, he done a lecture in Berwick about five years ago that I, I attended. What do you think about Nick's previous role and the idea that it has been overblown from an administrative role to something where he's referred to as, you know, the UK's Fox Mulder, which it seems that he wasn't. What's your take on all that? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I personally have no doubt that Nick was involved in the MOD and in, in, at least at one point. I think, you know, he, he says it was the early 90s, a few years with UAP. He was he was involved with UAP within the Ministry of Defense. Funny enough, it reminds me, it mirrors Lou Elizondo's story because in, in a lot of ways, Lou is a little bit like Nick in this respect because um, what does the Pentagon say? And what do what do the critics say about Lou? Oh, he had, he had barely anything to do, if anything, to do with ATIP. He wasn't involved with ATIP. The Pentagon even says he had no responsibilities with ATIP. And then you have Lou saying, like, no, that I actually was. I was actually involved with ATIP for, like, many years. If you think about it, like, Nick and and uh, and Lou, that kind of, like, mirrors, you know. You've got, like, the naysayer saying, like, oh, he had nothing to do with this. <laughs> so it's almost like the same pattern emerging yeah do you know what i agree and i interviewed nick for my seventh episode on this and i, I introduced him as the uk's Luis elizondo at the time and i agree with you to a point i think what we have though is there seems to be a lot more evidence has come out since that lou is who he says he was and i'm, I'm not saying nick didn't work at the mod nick absolutely did and he was involved on the ufo desk what what i think though seems to be the case and i will caveat this at the end is that the his job seems to have been far more administrative than than maybe Nick has allowed to be embellished, and I don't think he done that. I think the UK media done that for him decades ago, and he's he's a, he's a good guy. He's charismatic and he's nice to listen to, and no doubt he's he's had some exposure. But what potentially has happened is that the I think the British military are probably better than the US military at keeping things quiet. 
because you know they're very tight-lipped about a lot of things here in the UK, especially when it comes to UFOs and UAP, and there seems to be no one backing up what Nick Pope maybe in the past was was claimed to have done. And that's not to say that he maybe didn't do that, but you're right in the sense that that's what's came out from the Pentagon and DOD in terms of, of Lou Elizondo as well. But that's that is by the by because Nick has fashioned himself a role and a, a relatively positive one within ufology as as we understand ufology and he has a good talking head to have alongside you on, on the basement office as well um now what i want to know is what's been your favorite part of recording the basement office ha, uh, sorry basement office has it been a favorite topic to cover um it's a great question so i would say like my favorite qu- my favorite part about the basement office in general just overall is that the post allows me to get deep in the weeds it's not it's not a headlines uh show it's not a it, it, we get into the details um where i'm it allows me to be skeptical uh there's breathing room to really kind of get into what happened versus the rumor um, I would say uh, 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 it also reinvigorated my interest in the topic because for every episode, I need to do my homework, I need to do my research, and I need to figure out what the hell's going on. <laughs> and uh, and in in doing that, I learn a lot. And out of that, I I, I gravitate to certain cases. Um, the Zimbabwe aerial school case in 1994 being an example of a case that. I can't outright dismiss, or I, I also can't outright um, create a devil's advocate. You know, I, I can't create another argument to what really happened with those children. While there are explanations, none of them make sense to me. Um, the uh, 1976 Canary Islands case um, just baffles me. <laughs> uh, not not just because of the immensity of the UAP itself, which was towering over the city i mean skyscrapers were just like it was over the whole city and um but the documentation the the spanish military uh, investigated the hell out of that case and there's a stack of 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 real military documents and in those documents the military says all right this was an unidentified aerial phenomenon like after everything we've researched it is completely baffling that and then added to that the fact that entities beings were seen inside the orb that's a difficult case for me because i can't outright dismiss it and there are a bunch i mean the water thing usos uh ufos originating from the water sources from the oceans that was new to me you know i I understand a lot of ufologists it's not new to them because they've been in this for years but to me as a journalist i was like what you know like they're coming from the oceans you know so that episode our our episode about the oceans and the water was was just overwhelmingly mind-blowing to me and i've got a listener question on those lines later on about your your usos episode that what that was a good one and and like you say it's been around for a long time the idea and that notion but i think again since 2017 in the u.s military and the navy playing such a big part in this it's made the mainstream media sit up and take notice and go oh so it's not just flying saucers coming from space we have other shaped objects potentially coming in and out the water as well now listen i would be amiss if i didn't mention your interview with eric davies um a man who is quite enigmatic himself um it caused quite a stir it still has the conversation going online i can imagine as i say that name somewhere joe mergia's ears have pricked up so i would encourage anyone who hasn't seen the the interview it's about 15 16 minutes long check out on the basement office page however how long was the original interview with eric davies Okay, so from the time he logged in until the time he logged out, around 58 minutes. Okay, so why did we get 16 minutes? So you didn't just get 16 minutes, you got... So in episode 7 of The Basement Office, he's in episode 7 of The Basement Office, and then we released... And then after that, I released however long it was, 15 minutes extra of from the interview. Um... The rest of it is sitting on a hard drive. 
<laughs> yeah, so that's that's what I want to talk about is that the rest of it piece. Now you you get this regularly, and I imagine you get DMs about it and contacted via email and whatnot. Every day. Why, why, why is the rest of it still sitting on a hard drive? Um, because it's like, um, like if I was you, right? If I if I was the host of the UFO podcast, who owns the UFO podcast? Me. You do. You control that property, right? So you can release whatever the hell you want. I'm. I don't own the New York Post, and I don't own their intellectual property. I don't own a single second of the basement office. And so there is a, a approval process that when you're at a media company of that level, your average reporter just can't release whatever the hell he wants. Um, and so the the Eric Davis stuff is not lost to time. It's still in a queue and it's still in a plan to be released. It's just how and why Um, the, you know, when you're talking about a big media company that covers a million stories a day and might do one or two UFO stories a month um, at what I need to couch it in a way that makes it relevant for release. So Hope is not lost. I'm fighting the good battle to get it out. There's some uh, there's some good stuff in there. It's just we're in a big transitional phase, especially with the basement office. I mean, our last ep- our last official episode was was I think June of 2020, so over a year ago. Yeah. Um, with Nick, meaning our, my last real episode with Nick, um, COVID threw a wrench, like a massive wrench into everything and just everything got smaller everything got more focused and across the board i think in every media company and so um i'm stuck in the middle of that essentially i it's not as easy as me waking up one morning and going you know what i'll release the eric davis thing today boop like it doesn't work like that (laughs) So that so that that's fair. So the New York Post owns that footage. That's their intellectual property. That the contents of that interview. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's how it works. Not, not just the basement office. Yeah, they they own the footage. Okay. So yeah. at the end of the the fifteen minute extended bonus piece that you dropped, you you said, and I'm going to turn this back on you because you said to Eric Davis, I don't know if you remember, I'm looking for a crumb something a nugget anything that you can tell me and that was pretty much paraphrasing you but what what could people expect to see from what's on that hard drive because you can imagine what must be going through people's minds as to what may or may not be on it is it a case of tempering expectations yeah okay so um well first my quote that you just said about give me a nugget a crumb was its context was specific Uh, Eric Davis, at that point in December 2019, which is when the interview was, told me that ATIP never ended and that it still existed and that it had a new name. Um, What I was asking him was, can you please tell me the new name? (laughs) What is the new name of the new ATIP? And he wouldn't uh, tell me. And and then I said, hey, can you give me a nugget, a crumb, whatever, a clue? I mean, we know it's the UAPTF release. That would be it, you know, the new thing. Okay, so as for hints is what's on the new thing. Super sciencey, wonky stuff. So I'll give you an example. He and I talk for three and a half to four minutes just about wormholes. Uh, We talk about warp bubbles uh, for like five minutes. I mean, he gets super sciencey. Warp bubbles. uh, Obviously, there's two minutes just under two or just around two minutes of him responding to the Wilson Davis notes. Um, and then there's, uh, oh, and then there's more about him. I ask him, what is your theory, personal theory about what you think the ultimate truth is? Are they alien, interdimensional, etc.? And he gives me that. And I think a clip of that was released recently. Okay. And listen, that, when that footage comes out, people will go and look at it. I will not pursue that because I, I want to see that myself and I don't want to see that or hear from it, you know, secondhand, even though you were involved in the interview. So I appreciate you giving us those those bite-sized chunks. Can I give also your viewers who may be UFO Twitters, Twitterers uh, some perspective? Sure. The Eric Davis episode of The Basement Office, the, the, the bonus episode where it's just him and me talking, 
is our least popular Basement Office episode. In, in terms of views and engagement, it is absolutely bottom. It is the least uh, successful episode we've ever released. And so I understand that within a certain pocket, um, people might be super interested in what Eric Davis has. But as for like the main audience of our show, no one seems to care. <laughs> Do, do you know what though? I, I can get that. And is there anything to do with the algorithm on that? Because I searched for it earlier just to go back and watch it again. And I typed in basement office. And I think the first thing that came up was like episode seven or episode 11 or something. And it was hard to find that. I had to go into basement office and go through the playlist to get it. And in a day and age where people want stuff to come up bang straight away, if they don't see it in the top couple of search results, it can go amiss. So I just don't want it to be downplayed how good, you know, those pieces are and how relevant they could be. Um, I, I think that can can definitely play a part in that, especially yeah. with a younger generation. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, the search algorithm could play a part in it. I mean, but I uh, just overall, the basement office isn't that accessible. <laughs> There's, You know, it's, in general it's like it doesn't have its own channel it doesn't have its own website it doesn't yeah. have its own streaming platform and so you do have to go look for it and that's something that you know i'm struggling with and trying to figure out but um yeah so i get that i get what you're saying yeah and, and listen do you know what you touch on something and this this may be unpopular but i've mentioned this before and I, i'm always honest and i stick by this stuff that there's there's an entitlement from people, especially online, and I include myself in some of this as well, that, for example, the UAP task force, when it, the, the report, when it dropped, you get a, an outpouring of why didn't they disclose everything they know, we should know, and it's like when you say we, you mean UFO Twitter, that is like not point not 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 one percent of the population no one's really paying attention and I, I know people like Lou and Chris Mellon and not talk about the impact and there will be some sort of impact from that social media but it's not huge you don't have the u.s government sitting you know with bated breath waiting on sending this out to appease ufo twitter that's not happening so there's definitely a time and a place for that kind of stuff so i, I appreciate that i do want to touch on though Stephen, the wilson davis documents what are your thoughts on those obviously you haven't spoken to, to eric davis himself uh i I haven't talked to Eric Davis. I have talked to Eric Davis about. It. Oh no, no, no! Sorry, I'm saying you you have spoken to Eric Davis. What what are your thoughts on the Wilson Davis documents? Well, okay, so, um, and so those were leaked, I guess, in April 2019, and came up on my radar during my research for season one of uh, the Basement Office, and uh, I, you know. At first, when I saw them, I was like, oh, my God, this is awesome. <laughs> Seriously, I was like, this is awesome. Uh, and I thought it was just incredible. And honestly, like what I my initial reaction was reading through them a couple times was. Out of all the theories I've heard about what's really going on, out of all the theories I've heard about what's really going on and why, et cetera, how involved is the government? The Wilson Davis notes rang true to me, meaning this is how I would do it. Like if I want, if, if this was true, aliens, alien technology, you know, um, retro, retroactive engineering, uh, this is how I would do it outside the government, you know, unacknowledged, completely separate, almost in the private sector from from even the president of the United States. Yes, I was like, yeah, that's how you would do it. Uh, but then the next challenge I have is elevating it from my personal opinion and my personal emotional reaction to a journalistic analysis of what it is. And, you know, Davis says, I can't talk about it, which is interesting because he doesn't say, no, that's bullcrap. Uh, so that's interesting. Okay, great. So I've established that side. So the side, you know, here's Davis saying, I can't do that. I talked to Admiral Wilson via phone, talked to him one on one, and asked him about all of it. And he denies all of it. And emphatically, emotionally, frustratingly uh, denies it. 
uh, doesn't want to be caught up in this silly thing. Um, okay, so the former director of the Defense Intelligence Agency is saying, no, it, these notes are crazy and false and absolutely not true. Okay, so now I have to go find the other side. Who's saying what he said isn't true? Who is saying that Admiral Wilson's being secretive and snide and covering up? I can't find that person. I can't find that person anywhere. I can't find someone of stature who is publicly claiming that the Wilson Davis notes are true. So that's the wall I'm at right now. That's the uh, that's where I'm at. So two things. Would Do you find that unusual, though? I take it you would expect to s- Admiral Wilson to deny the validity of the documents, or w- were you not expecting that? I was a hundred. Of course, I was a hundred percent already ready for him to deny that the the details within the notes are true, and that I was not expecting him to say the meeting never took place or I never met Eric Davis. I thought maybe those two things could be true. Like, yeah, I met this guy, but we didn't talk about any of this. Like, I was almost expecting that. But for him to say, like, I never met Eric Davis, I don't even, literally, an exact quote from him is, I don't even know who that is, was, I have no idea who this person is. Uh, Never had that meeting. And those are on record comments, strong comments, emphatic comments, and I... I need to find the the counter to that. What is the counter to that? And I don't know who that is. What do you think or what do you put in Luella Zondo's comments about Eric Davis when he's been asked about the, the notes and the documents before? And what he said was that Eric Davis is almost incapable of lying. It's not in his character. It's not in his makeup. And if Eric Davis says something, you, you should take that to the bank. Would you think there's any way that that is Lou Elizondo, you know, by proxy validating the documents? I don't know. It's or a is blanket. That, is that too it, much? Is it too it's much? It's a blanket a statement. It's a blanket statement. I mean, I, I there's, I to speak to Eric Davis's character, I could print, you know, speaking to. Dr. Davis's character, Lou Elizondo, says, you know, everything he says is true. I would you know, I would pay attention to whatever he says. Lou told me that Eric Davis is an American hero, an American patriot. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't outright say I don't believe that because I have no reason to. I have no, I have no solid reason to say I think Lou's lying. I think Eric Davis is lying. Or I think Admiral Wilson's lying. I have no solid reason to do that yet but until i do <laughs> I, I can't release a a good story to the layman you have to understand that like probably 99 yeah. percent of new york post readers don't know anything about ufos you know yeah. and so yeah. in order to release that story i need to justify that story and usually the the best journalistic way to do that is this person claims this but this person claims this i as a journalist took a look at both and here's what I found. I just can't find that other side with Wilson and, Davis. And and that speaks to your journalistic integrity and that's that's the right way to do this. But as someone so like me, I'm biased and I want to believe the guy who's talking about UFOs, crash retrievals, warp drives and everything else, because that's the stuff I want to be true. But I've still got to understand that there's a chance it may not be because there's no 100% proof. And that's pretty much like this whole topic and subject. Can I ask you a question? Why Why do you want that to be true? What Eric, what Eric Davis says or what's within the notes? Because I want that to start to be the, do you know what? Yep, we do have the crash retrieval programs. We do have this. I I can believe that, but it's still that extra evidence. I don't think we've got anyone smoking gun in this topic that we're ever going to get, I think. And I've always said it's going to be a folder, which is just a a whole folder of evidence that's the more weight to it, the more credibility it has. Um, We're not going to get one picture. I don't think if we get a black triangle coming out of the ocean, it's going to prove anything because people, and I've talked about this recently as well, Stephen, that if I go out with my camera and legitimately right now over my head, uh, like you described, a, a V-shaped UFO with blue lights is 50 feet above me. 
I take a Samsung S21 or a Huawei or a new iPhone and I snap that in 8K and it is picture perfect. You can see it. There's no gravitational lensing or whatever people claim to think they know about, okay? If I post that online and I say, here's what's just flew above me, what are people instantly going to say? It's CGI. Yeah, it's fake because it's too good. So it doesn't matter how good the footage or the picture or whatever's going to be, it's not going to be enough. And that's where I, I do buy into the weight of things. So for me, the Wilson Davis stuff being authenticated would make a big difference. Not the be all and end all, but I see Eric Davis as one of those really enigmatic, interesting characters that I would really want him to be one of those people that, that is right. And there's a lot of people within this topic and subject I don't want to be right just because they're selling books or selling cruises or they're in this for the wrong reasons. Um, I, and that's for me, that's a gut feeling. So I, I want that to be true. And in that, I'm going to ask, do you have a gut feeling? You've spoken to Admiral Wilson and you've spoken face-to-face -face, like with Eric Davis you know, on your interview. Is there either one you would lean more towards as being a UFO guy? Okay, so specifically being a UFO guy, Eric Davis wins hands down. <laughs> I don't think Admiral Wilson gives a shit about UFOs, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but do you think his denial is too... And it starts to go down the, the, the woo and conspiracy line that the guy in the military is denying everything and denying it emphatically because, you know, uh, but that's, that's what you would do, isn't it? Yeah, I, 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 I guess so. But it's also like, his thing it's it's not like eric davis just in the last few years decide decided to like talk about ufos i mean this has been eric davis's thing for a yeah. long time <laughs> you know and so it's it's not like some new revelation it's just um it's it's par for the course for eric davis do you think we've heard or seen the last of the wilson davis documents in terms of what we know do you think there's going to be more to the story I hope there's more to the story so that I can actually do a story on the story. <laughs> you know, I hope there's more. I hope there's more of something more solid. I mean, I hear everyone keeps telling me that um, there's a book coming out called In Plain Sight, which delves, has a portion that talks about the uh, new stuff about the Wilson Davis docs. I look forward to that. Yeah, that's Ross Coulthart's book, and he'll be on the podcast next week, so I will be asking him about that as well. Um, he's done a few interviews recently with a few different people, so so yeah, that's I've not read the book myself, so I'll I'll hold judgment. Now, something that uh, is definitely relevant, you seem to have been quite frustrated recently uh, at times online. Um, you've been in a few kind of passionate debates with people, and you know. I think part of it from from some people's point of view has been the the lull post task force report where some people are scrambling for something to do or something to look at and I sense you're getting a bit frustrated from that UFO Twitter community the social media side of things is that wrong because a lot of people seem to be accusing you of of becoming quite skeptical all of a sudden I would say I'm getting kind of fed up with all of it in a way, I mean, not just UFO Twitter, but like the media has just turned this into a circus um, of just knee jerk, unvalidated, who gives a shit like headlines, whether it's true or not, you know, and there's no real journalism. It's just become a, a, a what UFOs used to be and there still are, in my opinion, is fun. <laughs> ufos are fun it's fun to think about it's fun to think oh well if that's true that would be so rad and the media uh, i mean the entertainment industry latches on to that and have for years and i just see more of the same now um there are brief pockets of like deep journalism you know i think you know um tim mcmillan at the at uh, the debrief, uh, John Greenwald at the Black Vault, Tyler Rogaway and his team at the Drive, uh, the at the War Zone, um, you know Brian Bender at Politico. Uh, you have these really good, well researched, thought out pieces, but that 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 doesn't represent the majority of what's out there right now. You've got you know uh, Jeremy Corbell going on like national TV. And saying that the U.S. government, without doubt, has is in possession of alien extraterrestrial spacecraft, and it's like no one's really challenging. <laughs> As a journalist, I'd be like, "Huh? How do you know that?" 
Ah, there's evidence, huh? What's the evidence? Huh. That doesn't really sound like evidence, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. no one's challenging, no one's doing the very basic journalism when it comes to this stuff. It's just this this three ring circus. And, and um, let me backtrack a little bit in that, you know, one of the red flags for a journalist like me is if someone can't answer or refuses to answer a basic question, it's a red flag. It's a red flag that they either don't know or they're hiding something. Um, and when that same question goes unanswered to multiple groups, you begin to realize there's just nothing there. Um, I grew up uh, Mormon in the Mormon religion, you know, yep. Book of Mormon, missionary, all the whole yeah. spiel. And the reason I left the church was because I started asking basic, very basic questions, <laughs> like to people who should know the answers. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was just asking very basic questions. Uh, you know, Joseph Smith, for example. Joseph Smith was the founder of the Mormon Church in the 1800s, and he's regarded as a prophet of God in the Mormon Church. And I was, I would ask questions like, "Hey, I just found this court document from the 1800s saying that he was charged with fraud for X, Y, and Z. Uh, why don't? What do you say about that?" And just blank expressions and not being able to answer. And it was just a red flag to me that, like, oh, okay, so it's bullshit. <laughs> You know, it's not true. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you for not answering because now it's crystal clear to me that it's all based on folklore and it's based on embellished stories. And so when I when I ask basic questions, you know, when Jeremy Corbell says something on Twitter and I all I ask is what evidence? Literally, that's it. What evidence? When when uh, UFO Reddit says there's overwhelming evidence that you know, the government did X, Y, and Z. And then I just ask, okay, overwhelming evidence, name me one piece of evidence. And people lose their minds. It, it's, it's just a, a red flag to me that, because um, I don't want to get lost in those weeds. I don't want to become part of a religious movement. I don't want to become part of uh, people who are on faith alone um, pushing a story. And that's not me, and that's not what I want to do. I just want to find out what's going on and get to the bottom of it. No, that's some good stuff. And a couple of things. First one, uh, Mike, listener question. Uh, that's been answered for you because you asked about some of the best investigative journalists in the phenomenon. Stephen's given you a good list there to go back and check out. And I would agree with those as well. Um, also on the, the Mormon side of things, I've seen the Book of Mormon. Very funny. And also the South Park episode on it is education at its best if people want to check those out. Um, but listen, I, I was going to ask you as you started to, to talk, if it was Jeremy Corbell was one of those names that was frustrating you because he has become a very divisive character, especially of late in the in the UFO community with the Instagram posts and the hyping things up. I've I've shared before, Stephen, and I don't know if you see this, that Jeremy Corbell um, is doing some work as yet, whether it's positive or negative, we can't quite tell in, in breaking, it seems to be breaking stories and sharing leaked footage. Do you get a sense that Jeremy Corbell as a character is enjoying the niche that he is managing to carve out, that he potentially could be the face of this for TMZ? Because that's the type, it seems, that, you know, when, when Bob Lazar goes on Joe Rogan, it becomes Bob Lazar slash Jeremy Corbell being interviewed. <laughs> if okay. you get what I'm getting at, yeah. You know, I don't want to speak to Jeremy Corbell. And look, Jeremy does what he does, like, amazingly i mean the proof is in the pudding when it comes to jeremy corbell he does what he does and he does it well now i can't look i i uh with, with this whole story i look at who's saying what and who's the media gravitating towards who's releasing the information where do they get it so obviously i have to look at jeremy corbell and at first i was like oh wow like this is the pentagon saying this footage was shot by navy personnel they're validating the source that it came from the military um that's great but beyond that uh they haven't said what it is the pentagon has said nothing they haven't even said if it remains identified or unidentified it very well could be within the halls of the pentagon be identified they know what it is um but you've got people like Jeremy saying they know what it is and and it's it's 
I mean, just the other day I was in, on online and people were saying, oh, the USS Omaha, those objects that are on this Jeremy's video, they were summoned from the ocean beneath. They were summoned by the Navy to reveal themselves. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> like, no, like we can't. Dude, I'm fine with that explanation, but we can't just jump there. We have to get there by saying, well, here's this, and here's the whistleblower, and here's the documentation, and here's the uh, an, an, another witness. And, and But it's just a circus. It's out of control. It's anarchy. It's anarchy. It's anarchy. I mean, when uh, I'm fine with Jeremy Corbell releasing this, but that's where we should stop. It's It's footage. We don't know what it is. Here's probably what it could be. The end. That's that's all we know right now. To say anything above and beyond that is ridiculous, in my opinion. Yeah. So uh, you think it's a bit of a byproduct of we seem to be on a bit of a roller coaster, and the biggest peak we've got to so far was the the release of the task force report. And I think since then we've seen a kind of slow, steady back downhill. Things have got a little quieter. Some people have announced they're taking breaks from social media. They're going to dip out of UFOs for a while, all that kind of stuff, because it's such a big hype. It's like, you know, waiting for the, the Avengers Endgame movie. You you wait for so long to see this film, and it's either what you want it to be or it's not. What you just said, perfect. It is exactly <laughs> exactly like waiting for the final avengers movie it is exactly like the marvel movie the the or or you're at your star wars fans your marvel fans that's what they're waiting for and then they're let down if spider-man doesn't like kill whoever or come back you know they're like i thought spider-man was going to do that but you're talking about something fictional that doesn't really exist that only exists in your head because you wish it to be true. And that doesn't make it true. <laughs> and like, I am trying my damnedest online through asking basic questions to get people to snap out of it. Just like snap out of it a bit, sit back and go, okay, what do, what's really going on here? What do we really actually know? And it, it's my current opinion that most of the UFO sightings as of late including the off the East Coast um, in 2015, 2014, those highly documented daily cases are not extraordinary, are not otherworldly. And I believe they uh, very well could be adversarial spycraft right over our airspace. And nothing and no one is screaming about it. No one no one's covering it. No one's talking about it. The, the Pentagon is lucky, so lucky that everyone's talking about aliens because if in my if it was Russia and it was China that'd be their fault that'd be a failure of intelligence you know potentially eclipsing 9/11 and right there on our shores they're lucky everyone's talking about intergalactic spacecraft yeah and i don't doubt that from a, from a military point of view you're you're absolutely spot on that that would be a huge failure for for a military with what a 2 trillion dollar budget or whatever the the US military's defense budget is um it's it would be a massive failing on their part and embarrassing as well but i i don't doubt that some of these sightings or experiences are adversarial tech and do you know what i couldn't write off it still being sometimes u.s tech because i you know when people say the u.s government wouldn't test its own stuff on its own people i, I think any government pretty much is guilty of that as well so you, you can't write it off however that's a lot of stuff do you want to come back in on that Stephen? You can. You're going to ask a follow up. I could come back in on it. I, I'm going to go off that. So if you want to come back I'll in just on say that, one more, or, one yeah, more thing. Jeremy inadvertently said something on Twitter that I agreed with, 100. percent And I was so glad he said it. But I think he couched it in a different way than I would. But I agreed with it. When it comes to the uh, U.S. Omaha footage about the swarm of ufos i would call drones uh jeremy said these objects it was almost like these objects wanted to be seen they were announcing themselves and wanted to be seen and that is true i agree with that 100 percent, without doubt uh because um my without doubt uh, according to my current theory because uh how historically and this is historically precedented. If you look up the CIA's project Palladium over Cuba in the 1960s, the U.S. It launched balloons 
and those balloons projected fake radar returns. The Cubans and Russians pinged those balloons, ping, ping, ping. And the U.S., because of that, were able to um, observe, collect information on their electronic intelligence, where their weaknesses were, where, the, where they could uh, hide a spy plane. And because of that, they were able to fly the A-12 ox cart, which later became the SR-71, you know, over Cuba because they received that information. They, they, may, they announced themselves. This is how you collect electronic uh, intelligence is you make yourself known and you make that ship ping you with radar and X electro optical and everything. And that and that payload is just absorbing all of that and all, all that top secret electronic intelligence is very useful to an adversary. OK, here's how they ping us. Here's their reaction time. Oh, they upgraded their X, Y and Z. We know that now we know their weaknesses now. They want to announce themselves. They want to be right there over the ship because they're going to be paying. So I agree with Jeremy. They want to be seen. Yeah, and, and again, like you say, when it's data collection like that from an adversarial point of view, I'm sure the, yeah, the US do it, the Russians do it, the Chinese do it, other militaries do it. 100%. You, 100%. The more engagement, the more information they get back from that as well. So it's best just to observe as much as possible. Now, moving on from that, you recently met up with some of the, the group at UAPX, Gary Voorhees and co. Um, uh, a lot of people on there, guys I've spoken to a few times. Now, you said you saw something that, you know, reignited your interest in the subject a little bit. Now, what happened that you met up with the group? Was that planned already or were they just in the locale? Uh, and what was your experience with UAPX? Total coincidence. Just a total coincidence. They happened to be 10 minutes from me. 10 minutes, literally 10 minutes from me. I had no idea. And, uh, you know, Jeremy uh, hit me up and he was like, hey, like we're you're in California, right? And I was like, yeah, and we're here. And I was like, holy crap, that's 10 minutes for me. So I just drove up there to, to meet them because I had interviewed, um, you know, Ryan Weigelt and Jason Turner uh, for the basement office. But I, you know, I'd never met them in person. And so I was like, oh, I want to go up there and, you know. I miss Kevin Day by just a few hours. He was gone, but Gary was there, and it was great to talk to Gary. And these guys, you know, UAPX has been around for a while, but they've invested in tech, like real data collection, super awesome data collection, yeah. whether it be like Gamma, Geiger, FLIR, uh, various radio waves, and they go around – Jeremy actually, if you look at, at Jeremy's uh, Twitter account, he actually has like a, a mobile truck. And this truck Os is like Osiris. Yeah. Osiris. And it's like equipped with all this great stuff. And, and all it does is just collect raw data. And most of that raw data is either empty or prosaic. But, uh, you know, as you could see from their past investigations, sometimes they get pinged. They find something that uh, they can't really identify. And what was great was just not just talking to actual wit eyewitnesses of the Tic Tac, like who saw the Tic Tac with their eyes. Like I'm standing face to face with someone and you can when, – when I talk to someone and they're talking to me and I'm looking at them, I've been doing this for decades. I can gauge if someone is pushing the boundaries, embellishing or something and like, you know – Talking to Gary, Jason, Jeremy, like I just don't get that impression. They're just they're you know level-headed and and focused on on just the raw data. Anyway, I can't get into specifics because I because uh, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I I will say that's what they do. They collect raw data, and every once in a while they get something weird and they get something strange, and to to absorb that visually from a raw data is something else. There was no filter. A media company, a, a, a talking head didn't pre pre present that to me. Just to, just to see the general raw data is, it's cool. It's awesome. Can, can I just ask then, you can't go into detail, which I totally respect and appreciate. For comparison though, what would the difference be between the raw data you have seen that you've obviously you know, really been intrigued by and the the videos that Corbell has released with the radar and what's what's been different to this raw data from UPX that you feel is more substantiated? 
Well, it's from the source. Um, it didn't go from a cell phone to someone else's computer to an email to an Instagram account to here's what this is. It like I saw it from I saw stuff from the source um, and uh, clear. I guess is one way I could say it. No pixels. <laughs> so it's not. So, so it's like a, yeah. So it's like a footage potentially. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't want to um, speak for them because they got their own thing going. But I'll just say that, like overall, I was floored and impressed by their mission and the reason why they do what they do, and impressed with the technology, the raw data, and yeah, these guys have potentially captured some some cool stuff. <laughs> I'll I'll just ask one more on that. Could you say that mission would be sponsored by Tic Tac? Sponsored by the candy company. No, man. Tic Tac's been late to the party. Tic Tac was Johnny come lately, man. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all jumping on board now. Skittles yeah. being the, the most recent one today. That's uh, Skittles Taste the Rainbow, if anyone's listening yeah. from Skittles. Uh, but yeah, listen, we're listener questions. We've only got a couple of minutes left, Stephen. Uh, you've answered a lot of those within the body of the interview. So Barry, Rich, Dave, Mike, and others who sent those in, I've tried to include them, and most of it has come up within Stephen's answers. I do want to finish on the quick fire round, Stephen, which is where I'm just going to ask you a few names or topics that we've not touched on within the body of the interview, and you can give me as short or as long form an answer on each one as you like, if you don't mind. Sure. So the first one is Skinwalker Ranch. Cool, creepy, interesting. Um, I'm not convinced. So you're leaning more on the entertainment side of things with Skinwalker Ranch? Yeah. Okay. Next one is Bob Lazar. Nah. <laughs> no. Not con not convinced again? I don't really think about Bob Lazar, man. Um, no. The answer is just, uh, that's all I can say is no. Next one's uh, Louise Elizondo. Lou Elizondo is the reason the basement office exists. <laughs> Lou Elizondo is the reason I, we're, I'm talking to you right now. Lou Elizondo is the reason any of us are talking about this at all. Um, my impression of Lou, because I have talked to him, is humble to the point, believes in what he's doing, he's passionate, wants to do the right thing. That's my impression of him, and I have no reason to believe any of those are are wrong. Yeah, the reason I'm talking to you and started this, Lou Elizondo is a big part of that. I'm lucky to have spoken to him, and uh, I once got a two-star iTunes review because they loved the podcast, but I mentioned Lou Elizondo too often talking about current affairs. So uh, next one is your favorite UFO movie. Fire in the sky, maybe? Fire in the sky? Ooh. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm I, wrong. Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Steven Spielberg, without a doubt. No doubt. And that, that is also Lou Elizondo's favorite movie because I messaged and asked him for something I'm doing soon, what his favorite was. And uh, Lou said to himself that that was, he'd only seen it recently, but he said Steven Spielberg was pretty spot on for for what he understands about things so that no people forget just how young spielberg was when he made that movie i yeah. believe he was 27 when he was 27 when he made close encounters and that movie is so much better than it needs to be it's ridiculously good yeah it, uh, it's worth going back and watching and if if hearing that it's luella zondo's favorite ufo movie is worth making you go back and watch it then do that uh two more Stephen. do you prefer the term ufo or uap i prefer ufo personally but i'm, I'm actually i think uap says more U ufo says object uap says phenomena and phenomena makes you go what <laughs> you know object just says object but i i actually kind of dig phenomena yeah ufos bob lazar uaps eric davis um then finally what does disclosure mean to you Stephen? 
disclosure means to me. What disclosure means to me is uh, not being. What disclosure means to me is not being thirsty for disclosure, not being hungry for disclosure. Discl what disclosure means to me is ignoring disclosure. Because if if I get if I get focused, I want disclosure. That's all I'm going to focus on. I I want to know what's going on. And I think there's something stinks. Something stinks at the Pentagon. And I don't want to I don't want to jump on a bandwagon because I don't know if that bandwagon was put there by the Pentagon, you know? So a disclosure, it could be quite a few things. I don't want to jump on it yet. Stephen, it's been great speaking with you, and I hope personally you don't leave the bandwagon. I know you've had those frustrations recently, but hopefully your experiences with UAPX and, you know, the basement office comes back and it's definitely got its place, and you're a very good personality and journalist to have on board on the topic as well. How can people find you and follow you uh, and your work? Uh, I am on Twitter daily. At My handle is at Middle of Mayhem, Middle of Mayhem on Twitter. Uh, you can go to youtube.com backslash nypost, and the playlist with all the episodes of The Basement Office is there. If you want to find out what I did for the for most of my life, you can go to stephengreenstreet.com. Awesome. And all those links will be included as well within the description of the show. Stephen, good to speak with you, and hopefully we get to do it again. Heck yeah, this was awesome. Thank you. Cheers, Stephen. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, UAP, AM. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shut out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little more. Imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. Then I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head. And everything was weird and everything was wet. I called up my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toys. They thought it was my problems. And I think I should because it doesn't really scare me. If you really want to know who I think they'd be, I think it's you and me and us and we and him and her and that and she and that thing over there and what's that, Jay?